They're our sons and daughters, our mothers and fathers, our grandparents, neighbors, and friends. They served in a thousand different ways in places spanning the globe, watching, waiting, and ready at a moment's notice to give what was asked of them. So now, we pause to express our gratitude and love toward those who served. Each swore a sacred oath to protect, and each bravely stood in our place around the world, all so that we could stand secure in the land of the free. Words like sacrifice, honor, commitment, integrity, bravery, and courage hardly scratch the surface of our gratitude for their service. While our words fail against the enormity of expressing our thanks for all you've done, we still raise our voices and honor you in our hearts, which are filled with the deepest kind of gratitude. To all of you, we pause to say, God bless you. And thank you for your service. MRCC, thank you so much for joining us for be a part of MRCC Church Online. We're so glad you're here, that you've taken the time out of your day just to celebrate with us, come together and worship our Savior. We want to celebrate also our veterans. That video was awesome. We just honor you. We are so grateful for you and thankful uh, for how you have served our country. Yeah, thank you. And oh, hold on one second. There's something behind your ear. Oh man, it's an Alfred your Christmas job box here. I'll let you keep that. This is yours. You're supposed to return it to the church, Allison, as soon as possible. This week or next week, we want to get these boxes back so that we can get some kids who need a gift this Christmas a gift for Christmas. Thanks for being part of that with us. Oh space. yeah, thank you. You can either drive by and drop it off right here at the church on Sunday or during office hours or bring it to church with you. Right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We also have membership coming up right now and uh, Pastor Greg is leading that for the next three Sundays. So if you're interested in being a part of that, you can sign up online or just show up at this point. It's the 8th, the 15th and the 21st. Yes. Yes. 6.30 cool. p.m. 6.30 right p.m. right here. 6 o'clock p.m. actually, right okay. here at the church. Okay. Also, last thing, it's look it's it's beginning to look a lot like christmas yeah and that means we're gonna have our very near christian center christmas lighting extravaganza yes. on november 20th come by the church there's more information in your program and online uh we would love for you to come hang out with us on november 20th on saturday and set up this amazing light display that's a gift to our community yeah so. we like to have brunch together donuts come for the donuts if you yes. come uh but yeah crawl up on the roof bring your ladder bring your gloves uh, have some pizza with us. It'll be lots of fun. Awesome. Yep. Let's get ready to worship. Amen. Yes. Good morning, church. Welcome to worship today. Lord, we praise you for who you are. We are gathered before you in your presence to worship you, to give you glory. Church, let's lift up a sound of praise today. We sing. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety Let it rise Let praise arise We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything We sing with all we are and we claim your victory let it rise, let praise arise, yeah. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you, the God of victory. 
who's on our side, forever lives in light, with all creation cry, God, we praise you.
for more of you. You light the dark. You made a way. We praise you. Shadows can't deny Your name cannot be 
God, that you trust in you. You're so faithful, so good, and so true. Lord, we believe in your faithfulness and we worship you. We won't forget your promises, your faithfulness, who you are. You've been with us and you lead the way. You're true, we sing. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Would you sing this with us, church? Great is your faithfulness to me. That's right. Great is your faithfulness.
my faith. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Do you believe that? I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down, no. Yes, Father, we believe in the truth of your faithfulness and your promises. You are true. And what a thing to cling to, your goodness, Lord. In this shaky ground that we find ourselves in daily right now, Father, we need something true to cling to. And that truth is found in you, Jesus, our Savior, we worship you. You see, church, this is a wild time, and there's heartbreak, and and there are those going through a lot right now, even within our own church body. But there's a reason why when we come together and worship, the walls break down, the barriers break down, and the weight is lifted. This is what we were made for. This is what we were made to do. And so these times, we cherish them when we could come together and praise. And we make that choice to lay down the burdens of the world and step into the promise of who you are, Jesus. And to cling to that truth. This is what we're made for. And so God, we glorify you because you are worthy and true and good. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. What a blessing it is to worship together as God's church. Yes. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Glad you could gather with us at our online campus here at MRCC. Uh, To those of you who are a part of our live congregation at MRCC and and our online, uh, because of this whole COVID thing, we want you to know we miss you. We're thinking of you. We're looking forward to be back together with you again. For those of you who have joined our online campus exclusively, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, Welcome. Thank you, Pastor West and the team for leading us in worship. Uh, Let's move together into God's Word right away and let Him speak to us today. Open your Bible, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. And and we are in a journey together as a church through Philippians, remembering that as we seek to grow up in Christ, one of the things we learn to do is receive God's Word on its own terms, in its own context. Rather than thinking of our situation in life as the fundamental reality and then going to Scripture for commentary on it, we, we We go to God's Word as the fundamental reality and then move out into our lives. And going verse by verse through passages of God's Word is how we learn to do that. We're in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2 and moving down through verse 9. And and let's jump in and let God speak to us this morning. I wonder if uh, if you're one of those folks like me who's had some real surgery in your life. Not not the little outpatient stuff, but the, the inpatient stuff where you go in and they they keep you and they give you general anesthesia and the whole nine yards. I've actually had seven (laughs) surgeries where I've had to go through that. Five on my knees, two on my neck, on my cervical spine. And so I'm kind of a a veteran of the whole surgery thing. Uh, I wonder if you are. At this point, it's almost like a hobby to me. I don't even worry about it uh, when it happens. But that wasn't always the case. I remember the first time that I went in for a major surgery, there was, a, there was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of uncertainty. What's going to happen? How's it going to happen? And, and they're going to put me under and somebody else is going to breathe for me. And then they're going to cut me. And, and there was anxiety associated with that, real anxiety. And then, you know, when you get to the hospital, they don't really help you with that anxiety because what the first thing they ask you to do is take off all your clothes and put on this gown. 
You know the gown that I'm talking about, the hospital gown, the, the gown designed by somebody who has a, a very special place in hell someday. A, a gown that opens in the back, what is that? Who, who came up with that? I remember when I went in for that first major surgery, they said, uh, the nurse said, here, you know, take off your clothes and, and put this gown on. I took her literally, I took off all my clothes. And then I went to put on this gown that, that I thought of closed in front and had a tiny little tie. And I just couldn't feel secure about my situation. It was increasing my anxiety, not helping. And, and the nurse came in and she laughed and she said, no, 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 it goes the other way around. You put it in back. And I thought, well, that'll be better until I put that gown on me and realized that my whole backside was swinging in the breeze. And then I had to go to the bathroom and I had to go down the hall and I'm walking down the hall holding the gown shut. You know what I'm talking about. Fills us with anxiety. Life is full of little anxieties and fears like that. And most of them aren't serious. Most of them, in fact, don't come true in the way that we fear they will. One of my favorite quotes is from the writer Mark Twain, who said, I have suffered many things in my life, most of which never happened. And, and that's true for most of our anxieties and most of our fears. But sometimes our lives are invaded by bigger anxieties. Sometimes those fears, those anxieties, can bring tragedy. This last week, our little town was touched again by the, the horror of suicide. A young man connected to someone who's part of our fellowship took his life. And he took his life because his anxieties, his fears overwhelmed him. He got to the point where he wasn't able to see beyond them. And that's when anxiety and fear gets real and dangerous. And God wants to talk to us about that this morning, friends. He wants to teach us how to learn to live above those anxieties and fears. How, in fact, to experience what he calls, what God calls, a peace that passes understanding. A peace that doesn't depend on your situation or your circumstances. That doesn't depend on wherever you have a gown that opens in the back or the front. A peace that is supernatural in nature and that comes from God. And in this season, in the life of our nation, in the life of our world, that's something we need. And a Father God knows we need. And He desires to give us a peace that passes understanding. The Apostle Paul is going to talk about that in the passage in front of us this morning. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2. We're going to move down through verse 9, but we'll, we'll take it in bite-sized pieces. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2. The Bible says this. Paul writes, I plead with Yodia and with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, means fellow worker, co-worker, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, to help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Yodi and Sintiki, these two women in that church, he says, I plead with you to agree with each other, to cooperate, to choose to do what it takes to get along with each other. You know, sometimes, church, we wonder why God chooses to speak to us through what is essentially other people's mail. But the reason is that the stuff he wants to say to us, the stuff he wants to teach us, is personal. And it's best heard and understood through stories like the parables Jesus teaches and through personal relationships and the outworking of those personal relationships. Here, the Apostle Paul says that he, he pleads with Yodia and Syntyche to place their devotion to Jesus above the little things that have come between them as individuals. You know, church, that's God's desire for all of us as believers. 
that we would set aside every lesser thing that causes us to be divided as individuals. He's always seeking to pull us into the common ground of our shared faith in Jesus. Paul uses the word plead. He says, I plead with Yodia and Syntyche. We, we plead about stuff that really matters. We don't plead about stuff that doesn't. I, I don't plead with my wife about carpet colors or, or who does the household chores or, or what's for dinner. It's just not important enough to plead about. But when she comes to me and says she wants to make a, a, something called a mock apple pie out of zucchini, I plead with her not to do that. <laughs> Being a little silly, but you get the idea. Paul pleads with these two women because their disagreement works against something so incredibly important to a father God, and that is our unity with one another. And we have to understand that sincere, God-loving, devoted to Jesus people can sometimes disagree about issues. It doesn't mean that, that uh, uh, we have to decide which one of them is right. Sometimes who's right and who's wrong is a matter of perspective and time. Paul writes in Romans chapter 14 to us as Christians about disputable matters. He says, leave room for each other to disagree on lesser things. Don't insist that everyone agree with you all the time about everything. You know, some of us are still in the learning process. We're, we're further along or further behind in that learning process. And, and when one of us who's had time to learn something God teaches and someone else who hasn't had time, we, we can be very judgmental, forgetting that it took us time to learn the things we're demanding that others understand. Paul uh, desires that these women would cooperate with each other, that they would have peace with one another. And, you know, before we move on to the, to the real focus of our time together, understand that when it comes to this peace within and between believers, God is deadly serious about it. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, speaking to believers who were dividing into factions over their personal heroes and lesser causes, the Bible says this, strong words. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, Don't you know that you yourselves collectively are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you collectively together, you are that temple. Wow, those are strong words. But that's how seriously God takes our unity as a family of believers. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Rest assured that God will bring judgment and discipline on those who divide and disrupt the unity in the fellowship of his family. We must recognize that when we gather, we are the body of Christ in the world, and lesser things have to be set aside. John Ross tells the story of the great Bible teacher Karl Barth from a previous generation who, who always rode to his office in a streetcar in the city of Basel, Switzerland, where he lived. One morning, a, a tourist sat down next to him and, and the two of them got to talking, Dr. Barth and the tourist, and the tourist said, you know, I know Karl Barth lives here in Basel. It would really be a treat to see him. Dr. Bart saw a moment to have a little fun, so he says, well, you know, I know him personally. And the tourist said, really? Dr. Bart said, yes, I, I give him a shave every morning. Right after that, the streetcar stopped and the man got off and Dr. Bart overheard him telling his friends, I just met Carl Bart's barber. <laughs> he never knew who he was actually talking to. Sometimes we can be the same way about the body of Christ. Church, when we are gathered together, when we are meeting as the church, we are the body of Christ in the world. We are Jesus present in that moment. It's important for us to learn to recognize that so that we will seek the peace that God desires, so that we will understand that He desires that above many lesser issues. And then Paul goes on, and this is, this is our, our focus together. He goes on beginning with verse 4, and, and listen to what he says, because it has to do with peace. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, Greg. 
I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident, immediately apparent to everyone. The Lord is near. And then he says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, which transcends, which rises above all understanding, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What the apostle is doing is teaching us how to experience a peace which transcends understanding, which is greater than any circumstance, which is more powerful than any situation you or I may find ourselves in. The peace of God transcends, passes all understanding. And he wants us to understand how to experience that, how to receive that from God. And he gives a few specific directions. He says, first of all, rejoice in the Lord. It's a simple thing, but it means to rejoice in what God has done for us, not what we may have done or failed to do for God. To rejoice in what he has done for us. You know, the, the fundamental gospel truth is, is that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He has washed away my sins. He has done that for me. When I rejoice in that, I remember the reality. I feel the reality again. To rejoice in the Lord is to rejoice in what God has done for you. To remember it, to feel it fresh and new. You know, I remember when Rhonda said yes to my marriage proposal, I was ecstatic because now I knew for sure that my girlfriend was going to become my bride, my wife, my best friend for life. In the same way, Jesus has finished a work for us. It is done and accomplished. And when we received him as our Savior, that work is for us. Rejoice in the Lord, Paul says. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Means make it obvious to other people that you're a safe person, that you're someone they can trust, that you're someone they can have confidence in. Let your gentleness be evident to all people. Sometimes today in our culture, we think that the, 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 the highest virtue is to appear aggressive or strong or, or overwhelming. Now, you know, when Jesus said, blessed is the, are the meek for they will inherit the earth, that word meek is a military term, speaks of a soldier who's disciplined. Speaks of a person. You, when you're around a soldier who's disciplined, you feel safe, not threatened. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And then, then Paul goes deeper. He says, don't be anxious about anything. When we hear that, if we're honest, often we say, how, God? I don't want to be. But how do I escape being anxious? And we say that because we assume that anxiety comes from our situation or our circumstances. So we say, until those change, I can't get beyond my anxiety. But that's not true. Psychologists tell us that most of our anxiety comes not from what is happening, but from what we think might happen. Comes from rehearsing what we think might happen. Again, remember what Mark Twain said, I've suffered many things in my life, most of which never happened. What was he saying? He was saying, I lived with anxiety because I thought it might happen. But most of those things I feared never did. And church, this, this tendency in us, this goes all the way back to the initial disconnect from God that human beings experienced when sin entered our world. You can read about it way back in, in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that after having sinned, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from him among the trees of the garden. They hid from him. They began to experience an insecurity about God. They were afraid of what he might say or do. They didn't feel that before sin entered their lives. But when sin came in, they began to experience anxiety. They began to experience trepidation. Here, here, here's the irony. God knew they had sinned and he had come seeking them just like always, just like he did regularly. He had come for them again, like any good parent. 
But something inside of them had changed, and now they were anxious. They hid from him. God says in Genesis chapter 3, why are you hiding? And, and Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. In other words, they had become self-conscious. Again, that's one of the fundamental effects of sin on our souls is that we become insecure and self-conscious. We become prone to anxiety. How do we undo this tendency? That's what Paul's talking about here. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but instead pray with thanksgiving. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will change, will fill your heart, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Let's break that down a little bit. First of all, he says that when you're tempted to feel anxiety, practice prayer. Let your requests be made known to God. Offer your prayers and petitions. Why? Church, because when we pause to pray, we become aware again in a direct way that God is there. When we slow ourselves down and go into his presence deliberately, when we choose to pray, we become aware again that God is there. That's what mitigates against our anxiety, to know that we're not alone in this circumstance. The psalmist writes about this in Psalm 46, verse 10. He says, be still, Greg, and know that I am God. Prayer is a stilling of the soul in the presence of God in order to remember that he is for us. It turns your attention to the one who is able to overcome our anxiety. But, but here's the thing, often we think that prayer in and of itself is the whole solution to anxiety. That's not what Paul says. He says, offer your prayers and petitions, let your requests be made known to God, but do it with thanksgiving. Underline that in your Bible. You see, church, it is thanksgiving that mixes with the awareness of God's presence to remind us of God's character, to ground and center us again in his fatherhood, in his care for us as a parent, in his love for us. Every time you rehearse your many blessings you, and, and remember how much you have to be grateful for, every time you do that, it changes you. It reconnects you with who God is. Adam and Eve in that moment in the garden had forgotten who God is. And so they hid from him. When they remembered who he was, then their healing began. And rehearsing your blessings, giving thanks, the discipline of giving thanks to God for your many blessings will overwhelm your anxiety instead of your anxiety overwhelming you. I, I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you to, to, to not just think about this as a concept, but to do this, to practice daily prayer with thanksgiving. As you do, you will find anxiety shrinking in your heart. You will find its power over you decreasing. It's, it's so easy to forget to be thankful. You, you heard the story about the, the older woman who had a little cart where she sold hot pretzels on a street corner in a big city downtown. The pretzels sold for a dollar, and, and it was her livelihood. And, and one afternoon, not long after she started her business, a particular businessman exited the, the high-rise building in front of her, her stand, and, and he stopped and, and took a look at her pretzel stand, and, and then he took out a dollar, and he gave it to her, but he didn't want a pretzel. He just gave her a dollar. The next day, he came out and did the same. The next day, he came out and did the same. And pretty soon, it became a rhythm, a routine. Every single day, he would come out, give her a dollar, and never take a pretzel. After five years, the man came out one day, left his dollar as usual, and the woman said, excuse me, sir, but the price of pretzels went up to $1.50. <laughs> How easy it is to lose touch with all we have to be thankful for. Thanksgiving as part of our prayer, as a disciplined part of our daily prayer, keeps us in touch with the reality that God is with us in the situation. God is with us in the circumstance. Uh, listen, friends, every human being wrestles with the temptation to anxiety. Even Jesus did. 
When he went to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was to go to the cross, he prayed and said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. God, translation, I, I'm anxious about what's about to happen. Help me overcome my, my anxiety. And that's exactly what happened. It happened for him. It will happen for us. Prayer with thanksgiving is the antidote to anxiety. Lots of folks are anxious about what's happening in our country this week, this month, but those who know God as Father know how to live above that anxiety. Paul says here in Philippians 4 that the experience of God's supernatural and transcendent peace is connected to our prayer offered with thanksgiving. Look again at what he says in verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Note, he doesn't say pray and you'll have peace. He says pray with thanksgiving and you will have a peace that you can't understand. A peace that is deeper than your situation, deeper than your circumstances, that abides no matter what's happening around you. But, but, but there's one more piece to the puzzle. And Paul talks about that in verses 8 and 9. Listen to what he says. Finally, brothers, on this subject of peace, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Set your mind on such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, put into practice, the practice of prayer with thanksgiving. And the God of peace will be with you. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, excellent, praiseworthy, fix your mind on these things. Friends, this is, this is something we have to choose to do in, in the age of media. Because we are surrounded by things that are not excellent, praiseworthy, good, true, admirable, we are surrounded, we are inundated with those things. We have to make a choice to set our mind on the things that God points us to. The peace of God is something that you help yourself experience when you pay attention to what you pay attention to. Notice the connection between what you think about in the passage here and your awareness of the peace of God. Jesus talked about this, and it's, it's something we desperately need to understand, again, in this age of media. Listen, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness, and if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, Jesus said, what you fix your attention on, what you choose to set your attention on, will govern whether in your spirit, in your soul, there is light or darkness, or more pointedly, whether you experience either as such. Lots of people these days are trying to live on a steady diet of fear-mongering media, or salacious and titillating TV or Netflix or whatever, or horror movies filled with filth and violence, or relentlessly hate-filled talk radio designed to stir up your anger, and still walk with the peace of God. You're working against yourself. It's like standing on a door you're trying to open. God says instead, Greg, Think about what you choose to give your attention to. If you're on a steady diet of junk food, it doesn't matter how much you want to feel good, you're going to feel cruddy. <laughs> and the same is true of your soul. In, like you can't hear the radio playing music when someone's running a power saw in the room. You can't hear the Spirit of God offering you peace when your attention is cluttered with what's wicked, with what's filthy, with what's wrong. Uh, this may sound old-fashioned, but it is in fact eternally true, and there's a difference between those two things. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is admirable, you can always find those things. You and I can always find, it's just a matter of choosing to see them. 
I was deeply moved by a story I read recently about a group of police officers in North Carolina who were facing a group of angry protesters. And we can all sense the tension in moments like that. This group of police officers, though, did something unprecedented, something not often done. And that was that as they faced this line of protesters, they decided to get down on their knees and invite the protesters to join hands with them so they could pray together for peace. Oh, church, those things are happening every bit as much as the things that bring you anxiety. Those things are just as real and more significant and they are happening. But where do you choose to put your attention? God says, think on such things. Fix your heart and mind on such things. You know, here's the truth, if I can really be honest with you. So many of us complain endlessly about the media while we endlessly keep watching it. God says, you don't have to. Whatsoever things are good, pure, noble, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, true. Think on these things. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Here's the thing, church. God wants you to experience a peace regardless of situations, regardless of circumstances. Jesus in the garden did because he prayed with thanksgiving and fixed his mind on God's calling. In the same way, we will experience God's peace, a transcendent supernatural peace, when we practice prayer with thanksgiving and we set our mind on what is good and righteous. There's an old tradition among the Native Americans of the Great Lakes region, and I finish with this story today. The tradition works like this. It was a way of, of teaching peace. What would happen is that as a boy, as a young brave grew up in that tribe, when he reached the age of 10, there was kind of a, a rite of passage that the tribes would take him through. At the age of 10, he would be called upon to go out into the woods. He would be taken blindfolded into the woods, a day's journey from the village that he called home. And then he would be required to spend the night alone in the woods in order to become a man, <laughs> in order to become a brave. Now, I don't know if you remember what it was like to be 10 years old, but I do. And the dark of the woods when you don't know where you are in the middle of the night, that's a scary thing. And the boys would always perceive this rite of passage as a test of their bravery. And so, and so they would go out intending to be brave and filled with courage, intending to prove they could do that on their own. But, but here was the backside of the tradition that the boy didn't know and didn't discover till the next morning. And that was that when the sun began to rise the next morning, his father, would always position himself nearby in such a way that the boy couldn't help but notice him as the light came into the woods. And the message was, son, I was here all along. <laughs> I was here with you all night. Even when you didn't see me, I was here. All your fears and anxieties that you felt last night, I was here in the midst of them. I was here to protect you from them. The message was this, my heart is always with you. In the same way, God wants us to understand that he is with us, he is for us, he will see us through these challenges. He wants us to know a peace that passes understanding. You experience that when you pray daily with thanksgiving and when you choose to set your mind on what's good and pure and true. That's God's invitation to us today. Yeah, our mission in the world is too important too sacred, too desperate for us to be overwhelmed by anxiety. So God calls us to learn how to live above it. I want to challenge you as when we finish here in just a moment to take some time to pray with thanksgiving. Let God know what's on your heart and thank him for his blessings. And then choose today to set your heart, set your mind on what is good. Turn off what isn't and watch what happens to your peace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your invitation to live with peace. 
God, we pray that you would help us to grow up into that kind of life as we learn to practice prayer with thanksgiving and fixing our minds on what is good, knowing that the eye is the lamp of the body as you taught us, Jesus. We pray for that. God, send us from this time with an understanding of where peace comes from. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm glad you had time to join with us. We'll see you next week. We will get through this pandemic. We will be united together again. Our online campus will continue no matter what. God is with us. Let's rest in that. Now may the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love him. Have a great afternoon.